Having spent this module gathering knowledge on the many different elements of the candle making craft, as well as learning how to make two separate types of candles, it's only right that this last section of module one should teach you the very best way to package and showcase these magnificent items you've so carefully taken the time to create. The packaging is a vehicle for the distribution of your candles and something to consider nearly as carefully as you have the candles themselves. The look, feel and functionality all play a role, so this lesson will be all about the exploration of that. Let's get going. During this lesson, we are going to be discussing the following objectives. Exploring the packaging options for the candles you have made. Learning how to brand your candles and demonstrating the best ways to display your candles. Let's begin by exploring the various packaging options for the candles you have made in our previous lessons. When giving a gift or selling a product, the correct packaging is arguably as important as the product itself. Packaging has many more functions than merely being a vessel for the product, although I'll admit to the visuals of it being my favorite aspect. Packaging is used to protect the contents and make sure they remain free from dust or damage. It can also be used to control the amount of air exposure of a product and to regulate the temperature. It's also a means to convey information about your product to any consumer or receiver. If you think about shopping for an item at a store, the packaging informs you of the contents. It will speak of the ingredients and composition. It might instruct you on the best way to use your product and any warnings and precautions you should take when doing so. Additionally though, your packaging is your introduction to your product. That make or break moment of the first impression of your brand. Before a consumer even encounters the contents, in this case, one of your candles, they will form an opinion of the product based on the branding and packaging. So it's of vital importance that your packaging draw a customer in and encourage them to desire to engage with the product within. With all of this to consider, there are a few questions you need to ask yourself and have clear answers to before you decide on your packaging. What is it that you are going to be packaging? This needs to be answered in a very holistic way. At its core, we are packaging a candle. More extensively, we are packaging beeswax or paraffin wax. We are packaging a candle that could melt or misshape. We are packaging an item that is heat and light sensitive. We're packaging a product that won't be badly affected should it come into contact with water or other liquid. The what we are packaging is a question that needs an expansive answer. Who might your consumer be? Whose attention might you like to attract with this product? You can be as specific as you like in thinking of all the possibilities. With handmade natural wax candles, I'd say our consumer is an environmentally conscious person. Someone who prefers products with fewer artificial additives and values the limited toxins. This type of person isn't necessarily going to be impressed if a natural product is overwhelmed with plastic packaging and might be more drawn to your product if they saw you using biodegradable or recyclable materials. Sustainable, environmentally conscious packaging would encourage this consumer to pay attention to your product. Your consumer may also be someone wishing to give your candle as a gift, something thoughtful and useful to give to someone special. This would mean they would like the packaging to be pretty, an invitation to the receiver to be excited to unwrap the contents. How are consumers obtaining your product, meaning how does it get from you to them? Are you selling directly from your home? Are you selling wholesale to a shop? Are you selling online or at a craft market of sorts? All of these manners of getting the product from you to the consumer will mean something different for the packaging. Selling in bulk to a shop, for instance, may mean you need to find a neat way to package and protect a large number of candles. Stores don't always have excessive storage spaces, and this means that you need to protect your products from dust and from being squashed. If you're sending products via courier, weight is a consideration. Bulky, heavy packaging can potentially drive up the price of shipping costs. While we want our candles to be protected from the tossing in vehicles and handling of couriers, we also need them to be as lightweight as possible to save on weight-related expenses. Both the candles we have made together during Module 1 of this course 
have been very traditional artisanal candles. My personal feeling is that in knowing that, we should attempt to steer our packaging in the same direction. This is of course subject to your opinion and personal creative preferences, and you are most welcome to challenge this idea. I just feel that excessively modern packaging such as a stainless steel container of sorts or anything metallic or overly colourful wouldn't necessarily tie into the more handmade feel of the crafts we've performed thus far. What we need to consider first is that both our beeswax and dipped candles are tapers. This means they are long and somewhat slender. Because of their shape, there is a certain amount of fragility involved in that they could be broken in half, although this applies more to the dipped tapers than the beeswax ones, but that both of them, if exposed to moderate heat, could be easily squashed if not packaged in a manner that protects them. This is more of a consideration if you are planning to sell them though, or need to ship them via a courier. If you are giving them as a gift and will be handling and transporting them yourself, you have some slightly different options available to you. A neat idea for packaging both beeswax and dipped paraffin tapers, if you'd like to give them as a gift, or if they don't have to travel far, would be to bind the middle. You could use any pretty piece of paper or cardboard to do this to group two or three candles together. Wrapping some paper around the centre will hold them together as well as give the receiver an area to touch on, thereby not marking the wax. Once the paper or card is secured, you could wrap some ribbon or string around to finish it off neatly. Similarly, you could use a larger piece of paper to enfold the bottom section of the candles leaving the top section open to show off the candle. Both these ideas are great because they cover enough of the candle without hiding it in its entirety. This lets the finished product do its own advertising instead of relying on an illustration or photograph on the packaging. If your products are being shipped, it would be wiser to package them in something that holds its form and closes off the candles in their entirety, thereby preventing them from being squashed snapped or melted together. You can get beautiful boxes at craft and packaging stores which won't cost too much. You could even take it one step further and include some beautiful tissue paper to create a more luxurious experience for the receiver when they open it. How lovely to take the lid off a box and find your treasure ensconced in the fragile paper. This kind of attention to detail will enhance all of the feelings someone may already have towards the candles. Should you be running a larger scale candle operation, you may want to consider having a box made by a packaging company that can print or emboss your logo onto the item itself. Not directly related to the packaging of the candles, but most certainly an eye-catching aesthetic addition, would be to use the wick as a creative presentation. In our lesson on making the rolled beeswax candles, I showed you how to tie a loop into your wick instead of trimming it immediately. What you could do with this looped wick is to attach a card to it. This could be your branding or instructions or information about your candle. It should also instruct the receiver to trim the wick to the correct length before attempting to burn their candle. Whatever you choose to do with this though, it's sure to be something lovely that not all consumers will have seen before. Should you wish to display your candle somewhere, Perhaps you intend to have a stool at a market or you'd simply like to add your unlit candles to the decor of your home and combine the storage with aesthetic. Try using a mason jar or really any wide mouth glass vase or holder for them. If you're selling them somewhere, having a few in a jar will allow consumers to pick them up and feel the texture, smell the beeswax and so on, which may make them more likely to purchase one from you. Now that we've spoken about packaging our taper candles, let's have a look at an option for packaging the beeswax votives we made in lesson 3. These are the variants we made in our lesson on rolled beeswax candles. They're sweet little candles with a thicker base that can stand on their own. While you could package these in any number of the same ways mentioned previously, they can also be presented in a drawstring bag of sorts. If you plan on giving them as a gift or including them as part of a gift, why not pop two or three into a gift bag? This could be some form of branding or merely be a nice addition to the candle gift itself. Next, I'd like to speak to you about learning how to brand your candles and or your candle making business. 
We'll begin with how to incorporate appropriate branding into your packaging. Let's think about this. If your packaging is purely functional in that it protects your candles and their coverage for when you give them to someone as a gift, you may not need to think too much about branding. However, if you plan on selling your candles, you're going to need to consider creating a logo for yourself and incorporating it into your packaging. Begin by researching products similar to yours. Do Google searches and browse through Pinterest and Instagram to see how your competitors, or rather, fellow candle makers, are presenting their products. This research is by no means a way to plagiarize other brands, merely a necessary step in finding out what your consumer will see when comparing your candles to others. It's also a source of inspiration in conceiving your own ideas for your logo and branding. Knowledge of other forms of branding will help shape and inspire you into dreaming up your own and help you to make an informed decision on what will be attractive to your consumer. We cannot underestimate the importance of good logo design. In many cases, it could make the difference between a consumer picking up your product in a shop or walking past immediately and focusing on the competition. No matter how good the product within your packaging is, if your packaging and branding aren't appealing to a consumer, they'll never even get to the point of knowing what's inside that outer layer. For this reason, it's important for us to take a brief look at the basics of a good, strong logo design. Your logo should be powerful and logical. Think about what you would like the consumer to intuit from the image or text you use. There are many subconscious associations we make when looking at a logo, so be sure that these all tell your consumer what you want them to know about your business. Let's examine the Wellness Warehouse logo. Their font is easy to read and follow. The incorporation of the only bright color being green immediately creates an association to outdoors, natural, health. Their illustration, although simple and a little ambiguous, alludes to leaves. Again, the association to nature. The overall story it tells is one of natural wellness. Simplicity is considered to be the ultimate sophistication, and in a logo that is no exception. The less clutter your brain has to interpret, the more quickly you'll understand and be at peace with what you're seeing. The less a consumer has to remember, the more likely they will be to remember your brand in the future when they spot it. To that point, you'll be at an even greater advantage if you can create an image as part of your logo that a consumer will immediately associate with your brand, regardless of whether the text is present or not. If the image immediately conjures up the words, you're onto a winner. From a practical perspective, it also makes printing easier. The more finicky a design is, the more difficulties you may pick up in the printing of it. A wonderful example of a simple design is the Starbucks logo. You can be just about anywhere in the world, and whether the company name is included on the signage or not, you will immediately know what the crowned mermaid means, and also that you probably need a cup of coffee. Make sure your logo is versatile. By that I mean, you want it to look good if it's printed small on your packaging or used in a repeat pattern on tissue paper perhaps, but also that if you had your own storefront, it would work well on a large-scale signage outside. A very busy, round logo that incorporates words, for instance. How well might that translate to mall signage that isn't overly busy? In addition, would it translate well if you had to print it onto a darker background, even though it was designed to be on a light background? How adaptable is your logo? Be sure to use relevant colors for your logo. Doing a little research into the reactions colors might invoke in someone is a good idea. We all have subconscious associations to specific colors, and knowing how your consumer might interpret the color is a good way to convey the emotional reaction you might like to achieve. When it comes to color, less is also more. The more color, the more clutter, and the more chance of overwhelming someone. Also, the more color, the higher any associated printing costs. Try to choose a logo with a long shelf life. It's natural to become excited about something new and to want to change things time and again as trends or fashions change, or even your own taste. However, in marketing, a logo with longevity is what you're really looking for. 
Once you've taken the trouble to forge the association in your consumer's mind, changing logos annually will mean you need to start the process from scratch. The longer your logo remains the same, the more ingrained it will be in your consumer's mind and the more they will trust it owing to their long-standing relationship with the visual. This is a little harder, but another important characteristic of a good logo is exclusivity. Nothing lowers the perceived value of your brand like buying into the common trends. For sure, a classic will never go out of style, and minimalism is always beautiful, but be careful when choosing a popular font or a trendy symbol as part of your logo. These elements will only serve to make you blend into the crowd, instead of standing out as you would want to do. Don't let yourself be confused with another company's brand. Make sure you stand apart. One more thing to note on this front is never, ever use clip art. If you are planning on using a typographical logo, which means a logo using only type or lettering, then there are a few things you'll need to consider here too. Sometimes designing a letter-based logo on your computer is easy, and you can see that it's pleasing to the eye. However, have you considered how it may come across if the size needs to be reduced or enlarged? Is the spacing between the letters correct? Will they be too close together and therefore illegible if they were to be printed in a smaller format? Try your logo in several different sizes before settling on it to make sure of this. There are many ways to create a logo and all the associated branding that goes along with that. The most obvious being to hire a graphic designer to turn your vision into a reality. However, this will be an expensive overhead if you're starting up a business so making your own might be better suited to your purposes. There are many free apps and computer programs that allow you to play with imagery and font. My favorite of all of these though, and one I would encourage you to try, is called Canva. It's a free app that can be used on your desktop and smartphone, and they have a very user-friendly interface. They have an extraordinary amount of high-quality images which can be altered to suit your taste and many beautiful fonts to incorporate too. I found the loveliest quote by Paul Rand to share with you. He said, Design is the silent ambassador of your brand. This sums up everything I feel about packaging design and just how important it is to your success. We've already covered so much information today. Let's take a moment to rest our minds before we continue with this exciting lesson. And while we do that, I'll introduce module two to you. In our next module together, we're going to be expanding on your knowledge of the many varieties of candles we can make using paraffin wax. This first little foray we've taken into dipped candles was the very tip of the iceberg and a mere introduction to the many beautiful things we're going to be learning to make in the future. For now though, let's get back to lesson eight and finish discussing how best to display our products. I'd like to reintroduce you to Morpheus. Morpheus is our Shaw Academy AI bot, and he is here to assist you throughout your lessons. During the lesson, when I interact with you, you can place the answer to my questions in his chat box. Alternatively, if you have any questions, feel free to ask Morpheus those too. Don't forget to rate the experience you have with Morpheus so that he can continually update his knowledge database and become more intelligent. Now for the section where we'll be demonstrating the best way to display your candles. We'll begin by looking at the basics of visual styling. Styling is another very important way of presenting your product to the world and can include both the product and the packaging or the product alone. There are two main ways styling is presented for taking marketing images or for in-store displays. The first would be in situ, which means setting up your candles in spaces where they might actually be used. For instance, on a dinner table or in a living room or bathroom. The other would be in doing product shots in a studio or neutral area where you are able to highlight the product without too much additional aesthetic competition. So let's ask ourselves, what do we want to convey through our styling of the candles we've already made? And what would we like to show our consumer? The size of the candles through setting them up in ways that create a comparison to establish scale. Have you ever seen how sometimes people will photograph a baby animal next to a matchbox or something shot beside a standard coin? This is to give a visual reference to understand the size of the object being shown to you. If a kitten is photographed next to a matchbox, you'll see immediately what the size of the animal is 
because your brain already knows how big the matchbox is in real life. Complementary colors are a lovely way of showing how and where the candles might integrate effectively into a setting or scene. You could even use different candles of cohesive colors to show how different candles could be combined if purchased together. Accessories of an appropriate nature are also useful in styling. These can include anything from the candlestick holders you use to the packaging, to candle snuffers or lighters and matches. You could incorporate some of the raw elements of the candle, such as wick and wax in their unused forms. Virtually anything that adds to the visual impact of the candle itself without upstaging it is fair game. Your imagination is the limit. Now that we understand that, let's take a look at how we'd go about photographing your candles on a styling board. A styling board is any type of board that you might use as a backdrop to create a flat lay photograph. These are very commonly used by photographers and stylists and are a handy tool to keep around so that you have a dedicated background on which to photograph products. It also helps with the consistency of your images should you wish to use the same theme months apart when photographing different things. You can easily make one yourself by painting some cheap wood white or putting some marble effect wallpaper on it. Some people even tile theirs if that's the type of background they might like, while others enjoy the look of raw wood. Regardless of the aesthetic you're going for, having one will save you a lot of time and effort in looking for good spots to take photographs of your candles. The one I'm using today is a plain white board with a little texture that I've added by using normal crack filler used for closing holes in walls. I'm also making use of a simple piece of white polystyrene to use as a reflector. If you see a harsh shadow along the one side of your product, try popping a white board of sorts up next to it so that any light coming from a natural source, like your window, is reflected back off the board and fills in the shadow to make it a little less harsh. The great joy of styling is that you are present to play. Collect a variety of elements that you think would work to complement the candle you want to display and begin moving them around to see what the most pleasing setup looks like. An important trick when using a styling board is to position your items and then arrange some to be at a different height to others. When you take the picture, you'll see that these alternative heights create depth in the image and work to draw your eye from one area to another. Take a variety of different shots of your flat lay by moving elements around in the shot, trying alternative angles, looking to see what different heights could look like, and including and excluding different elements. You can take images with styling silks and accessories as though your product is playing dress up. In doing this, you are hinting at luxury, indicating multiple spaces and aesthetics which could be enhanced by the presence of this candle. These ideas could make your consumer sit up and think, I want to incorporate this item into my home so I can recreate this feeling of this image. It's a suggestion, a motivation and an invitation to this one item that can contribute to so much more. You should also be sure to take your shot using the styling accessories and then prioritize shooting the product on its own. I always think it's best to have as much variety as possible so that should you suddenly need a specific type of shot for your marketing, you don't have to do the whole process over again to get it. Take a variety of shots in both portrait and landscape mode to use for social media, websites, and all forms of marketing. You never know when you'll suddenly need a specific crop of photograph to fulfill the demanding needs of the internet. Also, try shooting images where the frame is filled by the product and then shoot a few with gaps too. Sometimes you'll want to be able to use an image that has space to allow for text or a logo to be used on it too. Let's play around with styling our rolled beeswax candles specifically to show you how this process might work. First, take a shot of the candle alone, making the product the hero or focal point. This will give the consumer a good idea of exactly what they are getting. This neutral backdrop shows off the color and shape of the product. In this way, we are providing a backdrop that leaves all focus on the candle and allows the eye to notice the hexagonal pattern, the texture of the wick, and so on. For the next image, try incorporating raw materials that one might associate with a candle like this, specifically beeswax, honey, and a honey spoon. This is a playful nod to bees in general and the broader spectrum of honey, wax, and other bee-related products. It will make your consumer think about where the wax came from 
and what its original function might have been. The colours you are using will be complementary and invoke people's senses as they notice the ties between the wax of the candle and the perceived scent of the honey. It's also important to photograph your candles with their packaging. This can be done very literally as the product would be found in the store, or you could play around with the deconstruction of the packaging and arrange it with the candle in another flat lay sequence. Following on this knowledge, I'd like to discuss how to photograph candles in situ on a table. The most important thing to remember when styling a room, table or scene is that you want to create and then capture an atmosphere that invites the viewer in and makes it a space they desire to be themselves. Marketing candles means that you want to convey a lifestyle and a feeling, perhaps of coziness, perhaps of romance, perhaps of pampering and luxury. It's important to try and set a scene that complements the candles without entirely upstaging them. Styling candles on a dinner table is both good for you to take photographs of and a wonderful life skill to hone. Let's take a look at some key strategies to keep in mind when creating a tablescape. Create a height difference. Table settings where everything is structured at one level are flat and unappealing. If the crockery is at the same level as the low candles, with small salt and pepper pots and perhaps some vine leaves down the centre, you have a very boring table on your hands. Using similar candles of varying heights will create interest and focal points. You can achieve this by using a combination of taper, pillar and votive candles. Otherwise, using a variety of different candlestick holders of differing heights will also vary the heights of the candles. Don't however stop with just the candle height. Introduce other layers to the table. Multiple plates with serviettes to separate them, a water jug or carafe, and flowers of some sort in a vase. Not too high though, as we don't want people struggling to look at one another across the table. This may seem like an obvious point, but when photographing a setup like this, make sure that your candles are lit. Many people make the mistake of leaving the candles unlit so as not to spoil the perfect end product, but your consumer needs to see the candle in action. Use complementary colours. Whatever the hue of the candle you'll be showcasing, structure the colours of the table around that. Our eyes take more kindly to a cohesive colour palette. When you're inviting someone into that image, you want them to feel peaceful and happy, not overwhelmed by every colour in the spectrum. My rule is that if you feel like you're sitting at a children's birthday party, you need to remove at least half the colours on the table and replace them with similar ones to those left. The only exception is when using two colours to create a direct contrast, for instance black and white or a neutral shade to allow a single colour to pop and stand out. Use contrasting textures to create interest. Unlike with colour, using different textures won't overwhelm the eye, but rather guide it gently. Our beeswax candles are textured because of the hexagonal pattern. When styling those, try incorporating linen in the tablecloth or napkins, perhaps cut glass drinkware, and combinations of matte and gloss finished crockery. All of these various textures will make the table that much more appealing and inviting, in real life and in your images too. Now that we've looked at table styling, we'll move on to how to style candles in a room in situ. When styling a candle in a room, you will most likely be placing it on a counter, table or bookshelf. Again, our foremost aim in this is to set an inviting scene. Let's look at some ways you could create a setup that looks attractive and well curated. Groupings of three are the most aesthetically pleasing for humans to look at. Our brains are actually designed in such a way that as humans we look for patterns without even knowing we're doing it. A grouping of three items is the least we would need for a pattern to be formed. So therefore, it's simple, but also giving your brain what it's seeking, which is to be stimulated by having to move around a little bit. When styling a candle, you could use three candles or one candle and two other complementary objects. In keeping with this rule of threes, we must also learn to incorporate visual triangles, more specifically, right angle triangles. For our brains to be happy and do what they love to do, which is to be guided through a pattern, setting something up with a triangular structure will help it to do just that. In the image, you'll see we have one taller, larger object, which is the first place your eye will go. Once it identifies that, it will move diagonally to the next most prevalent item next to this and thereby travel down to take in each element within the triangle. Just like with our table setup, 
Incorporating texture is how we incorporate interest. Each texture you use will also highlight the one next to it, and so on and so on. Again, in the same way, we want our colors on a dinner table to be complementary. We also want them to be so in a living space. Having harmony between colors makes us feel safe and comforted. Match your candle to the room it's being placed in. And if you're using multiple candles, match them to one another in terms of hue. Try to include some living items in your shot or presentation. This can mean including someone's arm reaching into the frame and lighting a candle. It could also be cut flowers, plants or an animal. I'll often try to include my cats in a shot, not near the flame obviously, but perhaps on a nearby chair or in the shelf below the one I'm styling the candles on. Having a living inclusion in your images makes your client feel more connected to it because they're seeing some form of real life happening and don't just feel that they're looking at an impossibly perfect scene that would be unattainable to normal people. Always place your group of three on something. This could be a tray or a large book. Essentially anything that highlights and separates your grouping from the surface it's standing on. Again, this forced division between the surface like a table and the grouping of three elements calls out to your brain and says, hey, look here, there's a point of interest for you to engage with. All these methods and tricks we've spoken about are going to help you better photograph your finished candles, whether it be to show off your new skills to family and friends or to use them for marketing purposes. Whatever they are for, it's also important to know that you don't need a professional camera to take these kinds of images. The majority of smartphones these days are perfectly adequate to create visual content. Just look at the countless social media influencers running successful brands via their cell phones. Explore the different photo options on your camera. If there's an option to blur the background or work in what would be known as portrait mode, try taking an image using that function as well as with it off to see the different kind of effects available. When taking pictures of multiple displays and setups, Try to remain consistent in your editing. Don't use random filters from your phone or edit too heavily. The color correction and sharpening on the phone itself is normally quite good. But if you must edit the images, preferably stick to using simple editing features like increasing the contrast or perhaps exposing an image a bit more. Using a variety of built-in filters will distort colors and cheapen the look of the image you're taking. Your consumer will instantly see that you've done so and it will lower their overall expectation of your brand.